How do we come up with ideas? Where do we find our ideas? Uh, and really, kind of the start of every project, what does it take to, uh, to make a great idea happen? So my theory for an, a great idea is kind of the balance of the potential for awesome over the chance of disaster. Um, and I think all of us are kind of, when we're sitting in that moment where we're thinking about what is, thinking about the idea and what it is and what it can be, most of the time it's, this is going to be an amazing idea, and then following right after is, now I have to make it happen, and how am I going to make that happen? Um, and if I don't, it's going to be an epic failure. So I like to think of finding an idea and how, how we like to discover whether or not it's good or bad, um, is that any time an idea comes out of your mind or in a, in a brainstorming session, it typically falls into two categories. The first is it's a good idea. The second is that an idea that seems like a bad idea. And there's a, a venture capitalist in, for Y Combinator who drew this Venn diagram and I wanted to expand on it a little bit. Um, we'll start with the, the good ideas because the bad ideas I want to get to later. Uh, basically, there are a lot of good ideas out there. And when you're looking for a, good idea, for a great idea, uh, this is typically the wrong place to start. Because uh, good ideas are safe ideas. Anytime you say, hey, why don't we do this, and everyone in the room agrees with you, normally it's because it's a safe idea. It may be good, and uh, you know, kind of like, not to poke fun at Ethan, but when someone says, hey, let's do we need to do responsive design, and everyone says, yeah, that's a good idea, and it's a good idea, but the question comes down to, is it a great idea? And what ideas, how do ideas become great, and where do you find them? You can't look here because they're, they're good, they're accepted, and everyone, everyone knows them. You just have to start looking in the bad ideas. But to be fair, most, most bad ideas are bad ideas. Um, so you have to look at the sliver in between a good idea and a bad idea. And that's where you find great ideas. And often, they start, a great idea starts, it seems, as a bad idea. So for example, um, let's take Airbnb. You, the first time you try to explain that to, to your parents, you, you say, hey, I'm going to New York. I'm going to stay, uh, I'm going to stay in New York. They, oh, wh where are you staying? Who are you staying with? Oh, I'm staying with this guy. Uh, he has an extra room in his house. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, where, where'd, you, uh, where'd you find him? Is he a friend of yours? No, you know, I never met him before. I, I don't know. I, he has a place listed on the internet, and I thought it'd be great. Um, I'm like, OK, um, how did you find out about it? Well, you know, he has good ratings, a lot of stars. Um, and you know, I don't think he's going to kill me or steal my laptop when I'm out, so I think it's, it's going to be a great idea. And it is a great idea. But that fir the, the first time you hear it, it sounds like a bad idea. And really, that's where I like to look for the most powerful things that we think about or the ideas that we find. When someone said, you won't imagine the amount of times in our office someone starts out with, hey, this might be a bad idea, but, and that's when I start listening. Because that's normally when someone looks, is actually thinking outside of the normal bounds of what, what to do. They're looking at something that may not be established and really in that outside of that comfort zone. Um, and, and that's kind of the balance of that great idea. The one side is going to be awesome. The second side, it could be disaster. But to make it great, you kind of ride that line very thinly. The, the next, uh, the other section uh, I like to look at when I think about um, creating great work is luck. Uh, along the way, I've been very fortunate along the way. I've had great clients. Um, I've had, always had a great team that's worked with me. Um, and, and every time we've gotten to a project, crazy deadlines. But at the end of the day, we get that little bit of luck to kind of help push us through. Uh, and I used to start this theory here, where good luck is hard work. Because people would say, you got really lucky with that, or you're really fortunate to have them as a client, or you really, that, that project you, you got a lot of luck on. And I would say, no, it was, I had luck. But, but at the same time, it was a lot of hard work to get us there. And I like to, I like to tell, tell a story here from Nike Better World. And that project, uh, when, when they reached out to us, it was a nine month project. And um, we started probably, I think, early fall, launched in the beginning of the year, and, uh, or late summer. And uh, we, we basically had nine months to do it. And we, we worked with Wyden and Kennedy. And for the first seven months, we just kind of kept iterating and iterating and iterating. We tried, we probably went through three or four different website, complete redesigns, looked at a lot of different things, um, and finally nailed a concept we liked probably about two months left in the project. And then with about two weeks to go, we, we had a final design signed off, maybe three yeah. weeks to go, we had final design sign off. 
um, and a pretty solid, solid concept. We really liked it. But um, the creative team at Wyden and the creative directors, we all kind of got together and we felt like we really wanted to push ourselves with some extra time that we had left. And I think with two, two and a half, three weeks left, um, we decided we should redesign, try to redesign this site and nail something really awesome at the end. And um, I think it came down to the last photo shoot. I think it was probably two weeks before or three weeks before Go Live. And um, Dwayne and Seth, one of the creative directors there, were, were on a photo shoot taking, taking the final photos. And Dwayne was actually sending me um, iPhone shots of the shots as they were taking them. I was in the conference room at Wyden and, we, and I was programming and just like dropping these shots and quick one selecting, taking the shoes, putting them into the site. And um, they came back and they, they, I think they were a little frustrated. They said they were a little frustrated, like, hey, we had this crazy idea. We just kind of kicked over some shoes and started throwing them up in the air, um, took some photos, and he sent me some iPhone shots and messaging, and I, I put them in the site. Didn't really think too much of it. We didn't like them at the time. They came back. Uh, we were playing around with some new photos, and I accidentally uncommented some code, left a little bit, uh, left one of the images in there, and all of a sudden, one of the shoes is just floating on top of the other shoes. And then we all, I turn the screen over and we look at it and we're like, that, that's the idea. We're going to do that. And so we, we played around with it some more, um, kind of got the background working, got the, the foreground working, shot some new photos. And in two, two weeks later, we launched the full site, complete redesign based off uh, the parallax from there. Uh, and that was kind of that, that moment of luck or inspiration in that story. Uh, and I, but I wanted to kind of take a look at what really makes luck and if, and if it's required to um, to find these great ideas, uh, how does that happen? So doing some basic designer math, um, I look at it and I say, at face value, good plus luck equals hard plus work. Um, and so I want to isolate luck, and I, I do my simple math. So I subtract uh, good from both sides uh, for what I learned, and I get luck equals hard work minus good. And I kind of see that. Uh, and to me, that's sort of comes down to this. Luck equals mediocre work. If I work really hard and I take good out of it, it's kind of all I'm left with. And I, I think of one of the creative directors at Wyden, and uh, he would always he would look at some stuff we did, and one time we showed him some stuff, and he looks at it and he goes, what the fuck is that? What, what, what it is, I do not want. And I look at this, and I, I, I think the same thing. If luck is mediocre work, really the equation should be good work is hard work. And you're going to need luck along the way, but continually pressing on yourself to find that extra bit of, 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 ins of inspiration throughout the entire process, even when you're almost done with the project, to try to figure out how can we tweak this and make it a little better uh, at the end. And you, can, you find that luck and you make that luck yourself. So the, this is the, the third section, uh, failure. And it's kind of my favorite section. I, I think I've learned mostly in my life through failure um, and through just learning what learning new things from all the, all the mistakes I've made. Um, for me, design solves problems. Um, it, we're, we're definitely visual people, we're creative, um, but at the end of the day, design solves a problem for our consumer, for our user, um, and this is kind of where we, we've always been. And, uh, but the time is, is kind of changing right now, uh, and with our increased deadlines, speed to get products done, Basically, I think we're finding that we can't wait for the perfect solution. Um, we tend to be perfectionists as creatives, um, but usually, and now I'm finding more and more, that if we try to wait for a perfect solution, um, the problem has changed and our solution is out of date, whether it's through new technologies coming out, um, new interaction models coming out. Um, we can't wait for, uh, for us to find a perfect solution to a problem because it, it changes. And so the new model for me and the new model for working uh, in, in, our, in our lab is kind of do it first and then fix it later. Um, I kind of learned a lesson from one of our, uh, one of our developers for a, a Nike project we were working on. And we had, I think, an insane deadline of, of three months to produce uh, a new interactive footwear wall that uh, you can go up to the, to, the, to the wall, customize a shoe, and it gets made in 15 minutes in the back of the house. Um, and I think we had, I, I think I pulled a creative director on him, he said we have three weeks to get to a, a first prototype, uh, and I want it to look good, even if it doesn't work right for this first one. And after he looked at me and, and decided not to punch me, uh, he said, it's going to look good, and it's going to work good, too. Um, and kind of just started to reimagine what it takes 
to, to make, uh, make these projects in today's world where we're not afforded the luxury of time always, and it comes down to being very iterative about your process. And, and, and on, the, on a, a note about failure, for me, and I always like to say that failing isn't failure. Um, we're, you're going to fail a lot, and we need to fail a lot in order to come up with great ideas. Um, if, as I said, with, those, with a good idea, um, those are safe. And if you want to do great, great work, um, you're going to need to be, be willing to put yourself out there and, and fail enough to learn from it um, and realize that those, fail, those failures that you have or those failings that you have aren't failure. And, and failing is kind of the action. And every time, as long as you're taking action, you're, you're mo moving towards where you know you want to go, failing is an integral part of the active process. Uh, and failure is simply just a result that happens, but it's not, it's not the end all of what happens when you have those moments and you need to continue to, to innovate. Um, so the, the fourth part of the equation for me is process. Um, and kind of coming up with a new process for how for how we look at, at, at doing work. Um, typically today, it's, it's, fairly, it, it's very linear, and we're working, we're working towards an iterative process. And so I um, want to walk you through a quick uh, example of the typical linear process. Um, strategy usually gets, gets the brief, and um, they, they put a lot of thought into it. Uh, they come back and say, this, this is what we're doing. And it's really smart, um, and it, they, they hand it off next to UX, and UX says, great. We're taking this, uh, and now we're going to make it this, that way. And it's well thought out. They, 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 they do their, uh, their wireframes, looks great, and they hand it off to visual design. And now visual design says, great, that, now it looks like this. And it's beautiful, it's well kerned, well typeset, has probably a baseline grid, using great fonts, uh, and they hand it off to technology. And technology says, dude, it doesn't work like that. And they do it, and it's probably responsive, and it probably, it, the frameworks are great, everything works. Um, and then we go to launch it, and it goes, that, it doesn't look like this anymore. And we've all been there with a the project where we get to the end of it, and we all wonder, how did it get to a point where everyone along the way, we had great ideas, great designers, great programmers. And at the end of the day, the thing that we were making doesn't look like the thing that we envisioned. Um, and that comes back to an, an iterative process versus um, a, a linear process. And in a linear process, basically it translates to don't fuck it up first, make it better. And a linear process basically is don't fuck it up. Here's what I did. It's a, it's a great, great thing. I hand it off to you. You take it. You hand it off to the next person. And everyone's just in charge of making their part smart and their part in, in their silo. Um, in an iterative process, everyone is focused on making it better. So you're, you, everyone jumps in, and the idea is you release something, you all look at it, you make it better, you rapid prototype, you fix it the next go round, and you keep doing it. And that's kind of, and that's where we're at from our, from, from our lab, and I think that's the next phase of where we're, where we're all going. We all need, know we need to go um, through, through the design process. And then the last kind of part of, uh, of the equation for me is inspiration. And it's, it's probably the most integral part of um, continuing to make great work throughout your career. Uh, this, is, this is probably my career path, um, T over me. Um, and it, it's obviously super basic. I, I tend to look at it as where I was and where I'm going and kind of learning from, from, from all those failings and everything I've done and really just kind of moving forward in a, in a pretty linear fashion, um, kind of in the up arrow direction, ideally, hopefully. Um, but then I look at, take this same chart and I map it towards quality of work. And I think quality of work is a, is a little more exponential, hopefully. Um, and it, for all of us, it kind of starts and you suck. And then it sucks less. And then you get kind of good, uh, maybe a little better. And then finally, it should be fucking awesome. And this is, the, this is your quality of work trajectory um, that, that you're hoping for. And then you kind of look at the fun scale. And this is kind of where it works for me. I don't, I, for you, I don't know about for you guys, but it starts out really fun. Like, you love what you're doing. Every day you're coming to work, it's, it, you, and you'll stay up till 2 in the morning doing it. Um, but then at some point, as you're going through, you, you start to say, OK, it's not as fun. It's still fun, but maybe not as fun as it once was. Um, and then you sort of plateau for a bit, and you start to question, is this really fun anymore? Am I, am I actually having fun doing this job? Um, and then you kind of dip for a little bit, and then hopefully again, you get to a point of fun again. 
And again, this is a long-term career. I think depending on where you are in your career, you're going to experience this at some level. Um, I know I experience it probably a little more manically than this. Uh, but I like to call this center zone the Bill Withers zone. Uh, and he has an amazing quote that is, on your way to wonderful, you're going to have to pass through all right. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, things that we, as creatives, that we have to deal with. Um, basically, there's a, as Ari Glass would say, you have, talent, you have your talent on one side and your taste level on the other side. And it takes you a long time in your career to bridge the gap between your talent and your taste. Um, and the fun diagram is unfortunately the ride that you have to take uh, to get from your talent level to your taste level. Um, unfortunately, he also, Bill Withers also followed up this quote with one saying, uh, and take a good look around, because sometimes that's as far as you're going to go. But I wanted to leave that out for, um, for you guys. But, um, but I think it's, it's, it's definitely very appropriate. And the great discontent um, over, I think, a few years ago, uh, asked a question to everyone at Brooklyn Beta, um, are you creatively satisfied? And they, they went out and they videotaped it. And um, they got a lot of really interesting responses. And they put a great short film together. And if you haven't seen it, you should definitely go check it out. It's a really inspiring um, little short. But for me, what was really the most uh, important thing that I got out of it is kind of the, the path that people took when they were asked this question. And usually, typically, I would say 50%, maybe uh, when they were asked this question, the first response is, yeah, I'm, I'm creat creatively satisfied. And then they kind of pause the beat. And then like, well, no, I guess, I guess not. Uh, I'm, I'm not creatively satisfied. And then they went to the next one and said, like, ah, maybe, maybe I am. Um, and then it kind of settled on sometimes. Um, and I think that's, the, that's the, the plight of a creative person or a creative designer. Um, and, and I like to call that the, the circle uh, basically around the professional self, uh, creative self, and the personal creative self. Um, and I think for, the longest, for a long time, when you're starting out in design or you, you're working on your design, you basically put your entire self -work, creative worth into your professional output. So the things that you do professionally sort of define you as a creative. Um, and when you're in the first fun cycle of your career, that works really well. Um, and you, you basically, everything you do is fun, everything that you make is you, and you, you hold on to it very dearly. But, uh, it, but at some point in your, in your creative career, you kind of get to a point where that doesn't always translate. You, your, your professional output is actually not just yours. It's owned by product owners, and it's owned by developers, and it's owned by other people. And, part of the, and that vision is actually a great vision, but what happens is that part of your creative self, self-worth, gets a little bit lost if you just rely on your professional outcome to define like, who, I, who I am. And it, tend, and it used to be who I am is my portfolio, and my portfolio is what I do at work. Um, but for me, I, I think just as important to stay, to stay creative and to stay engaged uh, and, and to continue to, to innovate and, and, to, and to make good work is that you need to have a, a personal creative self that's just as, port, just as important as your creative self. And that is something that, because that's something you can own, that you can control completely, and you can get your inspiration through what you're exploring and bring that amount of fun back into it. And when you're, when you're inspired there, you can bring that back to your professional work and continue that cycle. Uh, so um, how do all these add up? Basically, I, the, the equation for me for creating great work um, is, is this, basically ideas over process. You need to have great ideas with a, with a great process times the balance of your inspiration over your failures. You need both. Uh, and, and basically, and then add a little bit of luck into that equation to, to create great work. Um, and all of that is my creative arithmetic. Thank you. Questions, yeah. Any questions? What's the best failure that you have experienced? Personal failure or professional? <laughs> um, I think professionally, I think it was probably my first company. I started uh, my first company when I was 19, worked on it for, I, I think, seven years before I left. And my, the biggest, I think the biggest thing I learned and my biggest failure there um, was that I was, I was 
really focused, I think, on my pr professional creative self, where my output defined who I was as a creative. Um, and I, was, I wasn't able to let go kind of, of, of the reins a little bit to let the company grow. I think we got to about 20 people before I, before I left. Um, but I think I, I wasn't ready to kind of step out of that role and, and let kind of other people sort of define that vision for, for the company. So. Hi. Um, in the idea process that you talked about, and it, it happens at every project, and you know, great ideas, bad ideas, at some point you're going to put hammer to nail and start working. Um, do you just trust your intuition when you know that that's where you're ready to go? Or because you can cope with ideas forever, but yep. you've got to start working at some point. Well, I, I mean, I think it's a great question because it's, it always gets back to how do you know that's the idea you want to pursue? Um, and, and I think for me, it comes back to that moment of putting yourself in that un uncomfortable position. Do you feel like it has uh, is just as much potential to succeed as it has potential to fail? And normally, that's a great idea uh, when those two are pretty equal. When they're not equal, you kind of if it, you know, it kind of slides back down and it falls into that good idea zone. Um, and, and then sometimes just being okay to kind of throw it all away and start over. You know, I, I think from, from a lot of our work, basically the best ideas have come, I mean, I think we all know it, when you only have a deadline of three weeks or two weeks, it, you tend to just magically find an idea that just comes to you. Um, and, and I think that's because you're trusting your gut and you don't have time to do it. Um, so treating those ideas, and, and honestly for us, it's hitting rapid prototyping pretty quickly. Uh, and then being able to, to, to vet an idea and be okay throwing it away and, and being okay with that idea failing. Uh, because once, once you can see it and you know it fails, you throw it away, learn what was good out of it, and then go on to the next one. Um, so there's obviously the parallax design stuff, right? And uh, then there's responsive. Um, there's a lot of, you know, over my career, there's been a lot of trends like flash and responsive and all that kind of stuff. Do you think there's another trend coming? Is there something you're seeing now with, you know, like, like, a, like a parallax or a responsive that's going to be like the next big thing online? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know if I'd view them necessarily as trends. I, I think uh, basically as an industry, we were all collectively trying to solve the same problem every two years. And I don't know that the, the year part is accurate. But I think if every few years, we're all kind of solving the same problem. So I think at first with Flash, which we can call a trend, and thankfully, you know, it's not around as, as much still. Uh, but basically, we were trying to solve how to add fun and excitement and delight and joy to websites. And that was what we were trying to do. And Flash happened to be that solution for that moment in time. Um, after that, uh, I mean, obviously, there was some people in reaction kind of went the other way. And that's where HTML5 was, was, was born, I think. But part the next the next thing after that for me was storytelling. People looked at how can we tell stories better? Uh, how can we take narrative to the web? And I think that's potentially you know where a, parallax came in a little bit is just how do we not rely on heavy animation, but how do we tell stories in a, in a different way? And and how do we engage people to continue to break the model? You know the fold and some of them are technical models or challenges that that we are solving. So. Uh, things like responsive, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is just as much a content solution as it is a technical challenge, because we have so many devices coming out at the same time. Um, the next one for me, I, I think, is actually something I've been pondering in my head a little bit, and I'm call kind of calling it context design, which is, to me, an, an evolution of where responsive is. And I think it's basically you know, responsive right now. Um, it, it really solves context in one area, which, to me, is, is visual. It's the, the, the tools that we have for responsive are what's the viewport, pixel density, resolution, things like that. You know, that gives us one thing. And to me, there's a triangle of the physical response. So that's going to be like touch, phone, wh what, you're, what you're doing. Uh, the context of intent, what do I want out of this? And then visual context, which to me is kind of responsive design. There's, that's taking that first section. Um, but the other two, we're kind of extrapolating, basically saying um, if you have a viewport of 768, and we're assuming that you're on a tablet, and we're assuming your intent is somewhere in between desktop and mobile phone walking, so you must be on a couch, kind of, you know, like you're, you're using your tablet. Uh, or if you're on a, a small resolution of 320, you're walking around, you're on your phone, it's high contrast, we need to change it. But we're making all those assumptions from a purely visual context, because all we have is visual inputs, which is just the you know, media queries and such. Uh, the next challenge, I think, will be how do we get um, technology into a place where it's actually letting us know, as us as the creators of content and websites or technology or apps, the, the context in which they want it. So the physical context, whether that's environmental, environmental, 
touch, uh, you know, mouse input, or and then the intent context, which is what do I want out of it? Um, you know, am I going? Am I walking while I'm using it? Am I stationary while I'm using it? Those things. Once we get all those three parts together, and we have all three of those contexts, um, then I think we'll be able to define and, and develop apps a lot, a lot faster and a lot differently. Uh, and I think that's probably the next one. I think we're a lot of it is being worked on. I mean, particularly in the app world. Uh, but those are quickly translating over to, to web design and things like that as well. <laughs> Excuse me, Jay. Thanks so much. Hi, Ian. If a potential client went to you and said, we want to hire you to develop um, a new idea, generate new ideas for us, in tandem with another group that's going to do it independently, would you be more or less inclined to take on the client, assuming you're entirely paid? Um, and do you think that's going to generate additional ideas, or is that going to put you more into the general good, mediocre ideas component? And can you talk about the pluses and the minuses, please, yeah. of doing something like that? Um, in, you see, when you mean another group in tandem, it's kind of like two firms working on it, or two people yeah, yeah competing? Um, I, I tend to actually, I would probably take the client if the client was good. It would come back to the client. You know, uh, I think pretty often we're probably put in this, that position. Um, and one, I, I think um, the best idea is probably going to win. Um, but two, I, I actually think it does help the client to see other ideas. Um, you know, we, we work pretty much exclusively with Nike uh, in, our, in our design lab. Um, and basically, you know, they come to us because they trust us to create sort of the next uh, or sort of look at the emerging technologies and, and come back to ideas for them um, for, for what they should be doing in those realms. And, and, I, and I think ultimately it still comes down to what is the vision that you want to achieve through the project. And like your, your vision as, as one firm is going to be probably different than my vision. Um, but ultimately the quality at, at some level is pretty much the same. Uh, it just comes back to who, whose vision meet, matches up with the clients. And, um, you know, for me, I'd, I, I would always tend to go for, I, I'd rather have the opportunity to present my vision than even if someone else is doing the same, because ultimately it's just two, two different styles of, uh, or points of view on the same, the same topic, I think. Um, with the, uh, when you worked on the Better World site, um, you know, you basically said that you pretty much scrapped whatever you had done in the last two weeks of working on it. Um, was there anything that you, any knowledge that you gained from that iterative process that helped inform what you did at kind of the, the last two weeks? Or was it just essentially just throwing out everything that you had? No, previously? I mean, it, absolutely. It was, it, we learned a lot from every, one, every round. So I think we probably did, I mean, by the end of it, probably six different versions of the site. Uh, you know, but every round we kind of defined tone. We defined um, direction of copy and, and photographic direction and how we wanted people to feel. I mean, I think for those of you who aren't familiar with the Better World site, you know, it was really, uh, I mean, it, not only the, the parallax side of it, but we really had no navigation at all on the site. You know, I think we had dots on the side. And again, I don't know whether that's good or bad model still today. But at the time, really, we removed all navigation, and we, you know, and we, we did the parallax. And for us, it was more, again, trying to solve that storytelling challenge of how do you, how to engage someone without having them to make them click on something to do it. And really, we learned that through every prototype. Um, you know, some of them were sideways, some of them had dots, some of them did have navigation, some of them had big boxes of navigation um, for different prototype versions. And for us, it, you know, again, we knew we were trying to solve a storytelling challenge. And that's where we finally navigated our way to telling the best story at that moment in time, obviously, um, using that technology. Have you found any um, consistency in uh, where or how ideas come to you or to your team? Um, is there a certain environment that uh, you find uh, is more lucrative to ideas, like maybe taking a walk in the woods versus a brainstorm session in the office versus in the shower, or is it all random and completely um, by accident? Um, I mean, so if you all heard that, just kind of where do you find the ideas and where what's kind of environment? Is there a consistency in an environment? Um, for me, there isn't necessarily a consistency, um, but I think the there's a few things that go into uh, cultivating ideas on a personal level and ideas from a team level. I think they're a little bit different. Um, basically, I think on a team level, what, the one thing I would say 
is making sure that everyone has the time to step away from that brainstorming room. I think the brainstorming room is really important. And we put stuff on all four walls. We have whiteboard tables, whiteboard walls. We'll tape things up and we'll brainstorm. But everyone looks at things really differently. So like, I may be the person that when I see 10 things in a room, I can look at it and throw out an idea that moment. But some other people need to hear a lot of things, go back to their desk or go back home, go on a bicycle ride, and then come back the next day with an idea. So I think from a team environment, I w it's really important to be aware if you want to get the best idea to, ideas out of all the people, is to make sure you give them time to have their own moments to think on it, because ideas do get influence. And also, some, some people just don't work the same way. Uh, but from a personal side, I think for me, it's being very focused on kind of the high level viewpoint of my point of view of where I want to take it. Uh, and then honestly, just taking a lot of time away from it. Like, I'll, I'll think about something, I might write a few notes down, and then go on a motorcycle ride or something like that and just kind of leave it behind completely. And then usually on the way back, something happens. Or you know, like you're doing something completely random. And then you, you find out something sparks uh, from a day in the past. So it's just a lot of time. If you don't have time in, in, that, in that sense, you know, most of it's just trusting your gut with your first response. Uh, and I think just allowing that to also happen uh, as, as well. Um, what do you think of atomic design uh, approach? Can it fit to any project? Um, atomic design? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I'm too familiar with it. Uh, Brad Frost wrote the, the methodolo um, methodology in terms of the design system. More like process from, from idea to, to final de de deliverable products. Uh, and you have to explain this a little bit more for me. Is there something, is it about the process that's different or is it about the implementation that's different? About the process and the implementation. Um, I mean, for, uh, without knowing exactly what it is, you know, I, I think for me, I would say that you know, every, the process to me is, it should be pretty fluid. So um, I think it's hard, particularly now, to say that to have a rigid process when you're handing, you know, you have someone responsible for UX and then another person responsible for design, uh, or someone who's responsible for design not being involved in, in the developer sense. Uh, so to me, it's, it's continual iteration as opposed to uh, a linear process. It's more about uh, the process that want, um, agile rather than um, siloed. Oh, like, wa like agile versus waterfall? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's obviously, you know, getting into project management a little bit, but I think it's just as important to the process. Um, I mean, I, I think that basically we kind of, we work agile, but agile does have uh, some constraints with, uh, project, with, with normal projects. I think uh, typically your client, at least for us, is, is pretty much a work back process. So they have a date, January 15th, that this thing is launching no matter what happens. Uh, and agile, you know, basically doesn't always ladder up to that when you're working in a agency environment, um, I think Agile works really well for, um, for product design. Um, and then you, you have kind of struggles with waterfall or work back when you try to manage uh, kind of ground up from Agile, I think. Does that maybe ans help answer your question? or Kind of close to yeah. what I expect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Ian. Um, so like everyone up here is speaking are pretty much web celebrities, so we all kind of know you guys. Um, is there something you suggest to get like our work showcased, you know, like um, submit to Webby Awards? Or, I mean, obviously the, um, the Nike bit that you did was, you know, stand apart, but what if someone uh, like us is trying to get recognized for projects? Um, well, I, I mean, I wouldn't consider myself as much as a web celebrity as, as some of the other speakers here. But um, so I think I would say, uh, you know, for me, a lot of it is, is just producing good work that you believe in, that you're passionate about. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Like, honestly, I, mean, I think I, I took two years off Twitter. Um, so like, I, I have a hard time. I, I go back and forth in my love-hate relationship with, with social media a little bit. Um, but um, I, I think 
for me mostly, it's, it's doing what you feel is most comfortable and what is most passionate for you. You know, um, and as far as the work goes, um, you know, if you're producing good work that you truly believe in, um, it'll get out most of the time. Um, and then the rest of it's just how much do you want to work on sort of your public self, I guess I'd say, uh, as opposed to on the work that you're doing. I think you know a lot of the challenges uh, that designers and creatives face uh, a lot in their careers. You kind of have to work on, I think, four things nowadays. Um, I mean, the first one is obviously your skill set and talent. Um, but that's if you put the effort in, and that's what we love to do. So that one you're gonna you're gonna work on, and that's gonna come. But the second part is just general like business and team and presenting and pitching your ideas. Like you have to be just as good at is based at um, telling someone about your idea as your idea is um, in order to get it out there. Um, and then the next one is kind of just the the whole side of if you're gonna do it on your own, the the business side of that um, again is equally as important. And then the last one I think is the the social side of it. Um, and you may, not, you may or may not be as good at all of them, but those are four things that you kind of need to take into account when you're trying to, deciding to do it on your own or you're deciding to, to, you know, to do it with a firm. But. Hi. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us more about the first company you started? And uh, just why did you start a company so early and how you yeah. ended up working at an agency after? Um, yeah, so I kind of have a long storied history. Um, I've been doing this now for about 15 years, maybe. Um, I started actually freelancing in Italy. I, I graduated high school there um, and freelanced for, I guess, around two years and put some of the worst websites in the world out there. Um, basically, my first website ever was for a cement mixer manufacturer, the big ones that you spin and it keeps the cement liquid so you can pour it into the ground. Um, the second one was for a water, uh, a northern Italian water distillery, or uh, not distillery, uh, like uh, cleaning company, I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> um, and then the last one was, uh, one of the last ones was for a grappa distillery, which is probably um, where I learned that, I learned about design, because to be honest with you, I think we were talking yesterday, like, I, I didn't even know design was a field. To be, to be honest, I, I thought it was, I could be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, um, and, maybe, and you know, maybe join the military if all else failed on that account. You know, but I really had no, uh, my, my, father, my parents are military, so that's why I threw that in there. Uh, but I really had no clue that it was actually a field that you could pursue. And so I, I just basically at the time, and that was probably 97, 98, if you could do HTML, you could call yourself a web programmer. And uh, so I, put, I did that for a few years. And then I came back to uh, the, the States on an engineering scholarship and then promptly realized that I just didn't want to be an engineer. I, I was gravitating towards this thing called design, although I didn't even give a word to it. Um, and you know, at that point, I, it kind of failed out of engineering school. And by kind of, I completely failed out of engineering school. I think my, my GPA was a 0 0.67. I went to maybe six classes. Um, and I, I really didn't want to ask my parents for money, and so I decided that I'd just start, a, uh, start an interactive or a media, multimedia company at the time. Um, and, or basically, I met a business partner, and the first thing we did was those multimedia business card CD-ROMs. And for those of you who remember those, those days were awesome. Those are my fun days. <laughs> just to put it out there, th that, that big peak of fun, um, basically, we had 14 four modems at the time, and then on these little interactive CD-ROMs, I could put full video, I could put you know, anything you wanted on there because I did not have a, any bandwidth restrictions at all. So back in 2001, that was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so then I started, we started that. Um, you know, we kind of grew it together for, uh, to about 20 people over seven or eight years. Um, and uh, I think for, at that point, you know, we were doing some pretty cool work. Most of it was Flash at the beginning. Um, and then um, afterwards, I kind of got to a point where for me, I, just, I was unable to sort of let go of some of those reins and, and kind of do what I needed to do as sort of the creative director of a larger firm. So, and I knew I wanted to step more into uh, just tr kind of traditional design or take traditional design values. So I left that and started a little letterpress shop in Denver for two years. Um, and then kept freelancing a little bit, then came out to Portland and then met Dwayne and we had our creative director duo. and We did that for a few years and then um, ended up with, merging up with Huge two years ago, um, and we have 10 people now working in our design lab. Cool. Is that time? All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.